Hi, and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we explore the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Dan Larrabee. And I'm Luke DeWolf. On today's episode, we are very happy to have our first returning guest, Siobhan Clark. You may remember her from her awesome book, uh, Children of Midgard. Uh, We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of interesting things and uh, similarities between various European mythologies today. Uh, But before we get into that, uh, you can connect with the Northern Myths podcast on Twitter at Northern Myths, uh, Facebook, Instagram. uh, There's at North Myth Dan, at North Myth Luke. And uh, as far as getting in touch with us, like, please do. We love it. It's uh, always fun to talk about this uh, kind of stuff with people. Uh, we always learn a lot because everyone's got uh, little tidbits of information that we don't know. Uh, as well, if you want to uh, help us out, uh, a review on iTunes is always very helpful. It uh, keeps us sort of at the, the top of the searches for this kind of stuff. Uh, as well, uh, well, reviews on anything too, like Spotify or Podbean, Facebook, all those, uh, basically wherever you get your, uh, podcast review is a great help. And as well, we've got a, uh, a merch store and we'll have the uh, link below and you can get, uh, t-shirts, uh, mugs. I think that's about it for now, right? Yeah. I'm sure we'll come up with some new designs once we figure out how to design things, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, As well, we've got uh, lists of recommended books and music. Are we recommending anything else yet? Not yet, but uh, I'm sure eventually we'll we'll dig into maybe movies and TV shows and things. We'll we'll update our website a little bit, and we we got some fun plans there. For sure. Uh, And if you happen to uh, go to these uh, recommended lists that we have, uh, you can click on the link, and we've got an Amazon affiliate program going on. So if you buy through that link... Uh, we do get a little bit of money back. So that always helps, you know, with doing the podcast and all that kind of stuff. So I think without further ado, unless I'm not missing anything. For Nothing the that I can think of. Perfect. All right. Siobhan Clark, welcome back to Northern Miss Podcast. Thank you so much for having me back, guys. It's, um, I'm really excited to get into our conversation today. Yeah, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be great. And we're definitely happy to have you back. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yours was the the first conversation we had planned. It ended up being the second we we recorded, but definitely uh, you you were an early supporter of us, and that just has always meant a lot. And it's been fantastic, not only just getting to know you, but seeing all the projects you're working on and things like that. It's it's been fantastic having you on the first time, and so glad to have you back. Thank you so much. Um, and likewise, it's just been wonderful to see um, you know you guys continuing the fantastic work and. I've just been enjoying all of the podcast episodes, so it's just really nice to be back again. Awesome. So, so, well, I know you've got actually your own podcast started, is that correct? Yeah, um, I I started it last year. It's called the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. And um, I started it up um, basically after being on the podcast with you guys, and um, I kind of got the bug for it. And I... I came up with an idea um, and it took a bit of a a bit of time to kind of develop. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just kind of scrabbling around or, you know, hitting out aimlessly at different things. I wanted to have a bit of a plan in place. And um, I really love Scandinavian mythology and folklore. And I started to look into it a little bit more. Um, I started to see kind of similarities in Scottish mythology and folklore. And it kind of grew from there um so yes i think i'm on possibly my 10th episode now um and it's just it's been brilliant really enjoying it oh that's wonderful honestly when i when i first heard that you were starting a podcast i i first thought that's perfect that's exactly i know all the things that you're interested in and and digging into and, and of course you've got your your book as well and and all the the research you do going into that and it's it's been fantastic to see that you've you've done something new in in this space and definitely seems like you're you're covering a lot of stories and mythologies that are varied right yeah yeah definitely i think um i want to kind of approach it from a storytelling kind of angle um, because I just love the, the whole 
kind of um, development of characters and storylines within these sort of sagas and story, you know tales and everything like that. Um, so when I'm, I'm reading a saga, I kind of do visualize it in a very creative sense, um, and I wanted to kind of maybe bring some some stories to people that they hadn't heard before or kind of a little bit more of the background or history of them and um looking into folklore especially is just uh, some of it is just incredible so yeah it's a really nice way to kind of you know talk about a little bit more about these stories and you know let people hear about them absolutely so what would you say so far as maybe your favorite bit of folklore that you looked into or something that's really grabbed your attention mm. Definitely um, the folklore of the Scottish islands, um, in particular Shetland and Orkney, um, because they had um, a, a Norse influence. Um, they, they had Norse settlers there um, kind of from the ninth century. So the, you can see a real kind of merging of different kind of mythologies and cultures and folklore. Um, so when you're reading some of the stories and you have read maybe some um, uh, Scandinavian mythology or folklore you, it, things to kind of jump out at you and you can see the links which is just wonderful um even place names and names of characters even um looking at things like um numbers uh, the numbers three and nine they pop up quite a lot as well so it's just all of these things kind of pop out at you and it's nice to try and look at that um a little bit closer and there's a mythology there and folklore that I have discovered is completely new to me as well. Um, so that's really exciting when you, it's something, you know, you hadn't previously known anything about. So I think that definitely has been the one area that's caught me. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the the gist of these uh, these mythologies then? Of course, yeah, definitely. So um, in Orkney and Shetland, it's island communities and um they have an, a lot of stories surrounding creatures from the sea. Um, in Scottish mythology in particular, there's a lot of nature worship and there was a lot of worship of wells and water. You see that coming up time and time again. Um, and so there's creatures that um, go by the names of selkies, which are seal people in, in effect. Um, there's also... Um, and any, I think probably listeners of, of your podcast will kind of notice this one called the Finn Folk, which is really, really interesting. There's a couple of ideas in there that, um, you know, I thought, wow, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so those are the main kind of, uh, t for the islands, those two creatures in particular um, pop up again and again. And there's also um, another being called a Kelpie, which is, um, has ties again to you know, Scandinavia, which is just so exciting when you kind of start reading into it. So those are the three main kind of um, folklores and mythologies that are the strongest and um, the stories that have kind of lasted until today. So maybe to, to back up a, a, a little bit here, because we're also not all that, uh, not not out of lack of interest, but we, we haven't dug too much into Celtic mythology or Scottish mythology the maybe even just on a, a, a simple level can you can you describe that area of mythology for us and maybe then how it relates to how that would have developed in these islands yeah absolutely so um celtic folklore actually encompasses a lot of different kind of places so um scottish mythology is very like irish kind of celtic mythology um, Wales has its own um, kind of varying mythology as well. And so every um, it's quite intricate. It, there's a lot of detail involved. A lot of the stories are very similar, but with different names, cast of characters and things like that. So it is easier to just try and break it down. For me, certainly, um, I just tried to look at the Scottish side of things and understand it from that point of view. It's... Um, it's a cyclical um, mythology as well. So it focuses very much on birth, death, rebirth. Um, it has a belief in the other world. And actually when um, a person dies and they go into the other world, the Celtic people believed that they were reborn. Um, so it was just a constant cycle for them. They um, believed a lot in nature worship and water worship, things like that animals and um, so we can see animals in particular such as horses and stags things like that pop up again and again um 
it's, it was an oral tradition as well. They, they didn't have a written uh, copy of any any of the stories or tales or anything. What they did do um, was they people have found um, kind of cave paintings or examples like that. We found idols or stone carvings and. You can find grave goods that show the um, sort of God worship, things like that. So I guess um, that very, that's very, very simple kind of, I guess, answer to <laughs> Scottish mythology. <laughs> no, that's great. To what degree is this all practiced, not practiced, uh, The this folklore and stuff, to, to what degree is is this around when, say, you're growing up? Or like, like how did you learn about all this uh, in the first place? Sure. Well, when I was growing up, um, my grandfather was hugely into um, Norse mythology. So that was the one main thing that I kind of grew up um, listening to and reading about. Um, he was also great at kind of introducing uh, me to different kind of mythologies as well. And his um, family uh, came from the Orkney Islands. So he had that connection, which was fantastic. So yeah, when I was growing up, he would um, he was always very good at saying, here's a book, read this, read that. And it kind of just spiraled on from there. So it was always there when, you know, when I was growing up. Um, because Scotland is, um, is basically, you know, we're, well, we're an island. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot of folklore tradition still alive, which is great. Um, in the Highlands, the Gaelic community is fantastic at it. They really keep this oral tradition going. Um, a lot of folklore writers um, have taken down the stories. And so there are books that you can get your hands on that give you wonderful examples of the folklore. And um, there really there is a phenomenal amount, I have to, to say. It's really good access in this country to our past history. So, yeah. That's awesome. I'm a little bit envious, actually, that there's <laughs> so much record of it. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. It's good. Uh, Scotland, um, we are quite spoiled here. We have got such a wonderful history. Um, there's so much to investigate. And you could spend a lifetime, I think, kind of reading up, up about the history of it and never mind the archaeology or past cultures or anything like that or societies. It's, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, that's that's wonderful, and and you know when when you say say folklore and distinguishing that from mythology, the the funny thing about those terms is I think they mythology seems to have its its own aura when you when you say the the word, but folklore really is just as important because that's the record that stuck with us throughout history to the modern age in in many cases and and so when when you say that they didn't write down a lot of these things but they're collected in folklore to what degree is is scottish mythology and folklore as a whole really preserved then do you think well um certainly in the terms of folklore um the we we do have a lot of folklorists who dedicate or have dedicated because it's been going on for many many years um their time uh, to gathering all these oral tales and writing them down into volumes so that we can um, there's some kind of preservation of that and the same with mythology and there's a, a really wonderful book um, by John Gregerson Campbell and what he does is he looks at both aspects so he'll have a piece of folklore and then he'll explain pro a possible kind of draw it maybe is drawn from mythology in some way which is wonderful because it's kind of giving you an idea of the community that it was coming from and, you know, the stories that they that were important to them. So um, I think folklore is sometimes a little bit kind of underestimated in so much that it can be just this idea of tales, not really of anything, you know, of huge importance. But it really is. I kind of think it shows how people were responding to their mythology and their interpretation of it. So it, both really, really important. I would definitely agree with that. It's sort of the, it's kind of how people figured out how to exist in the world. And then, you know, they would, they turned into a story so that they could transmit these instructions like to the further generations. And sure, you can tell someone like, hey, you know, don't go play in the water because you might drown, but it's, it's far more effective to be like, there's a monster at the bottom of the lake and, and, and not to, uh, not to make it like to take the magic away from it. I mean, maybe there are 
kelpies like I, i'm totally open to that idea but just like the idea that there is danger here you know keep your wits about you Absolutely. I would agree with that. Um, I think a lot of the stories of, say, the Selkies and the Finfolk and Kelpies really sprang up um, as a way, absolutely, to warn children um, about, you know, the dangers of, of water or anything like that, but also as a really good way to for people to have some kind of explanation for what they couldn't explain. So, people disappearing. Um, in these stories, very often, it's, you know, the, the Finn man who has um, abducted them rather than another explanation for, you know, why these people maybe have gone missing. And um, it's, it's really good um, way to to kind of, um, when you're looking at water worship and, and things like that as well. Um, there's a brilliant quote, actually, um, from a chap who wrote a fantastic uh, book on the folklore of Scottish water and springs. And um, he says that men knocked on the gates of nature, um, but they were not admitted within. So I, I really like that line. It's um, kind of the unknown aspects and trying to some way to explain that to to people, I guess. Yeah, that's that's getting into the interplay between the ordered society that civilization really represents and the the paradox of the the chaos beyond in nature. You always want to access that and order it, but it it doesn't want to let you. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I certainly have come away with the idea that um, nature is its own force. It cannot be controlled at all um, by man. Uh, it's just, and to be in kind of the era where there was no technology to explain any of this. So it was very, a very good way to explain it is, you know, the creation or the belief of gods and deities that were either in the water and the air or in part of nature. So, yeah. Maybe can you go into a little more detail about these creatures and some stories about these creatures? Because this this is definitely a, an interesting yeah, thread. Yeah, no, it's good. So I think um, the the stories about the Finn men, Finn women, um, I think that's probably my favourite one, simply because of the, um, the ties to Scandinavia and the Norse and everything. So basically in Shetland and in Orkney, there was a myth of um, what was called a Finn man. And he was a pretty grim creature. He had the he overall looked like a man, and he sailed um, towards the islands in a boat. Um, it had no sail. Um, there was a belief that the Finn man used sorcery. Um, that there was some kind of magic involved. The um, and when they did come ashore, it was purely to abduct people. They really didn't have any other <laughs> intentions. There was you know nothing else. They, interestingly, actually had an obsession with silver. So you could buy the Finn man off if you gave him silver coins or something like that. So that's another really kind of a bit of the story that I quite like as well. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, the Finn man actually, um, there was a Finn woman as well, but predominantly it's the Finn man who makes an appearance. Um, he's said to come from an undersea kingdom called Finn Fokahim. And also they're, um, just off of the coast of Orkney. There actually is an island now, it's called, well, it's always been there, um, called Einhallow. <laughs> but before, um, the Norse actually named it Hildeland, which is Hidden Island. And that is said to be where the Finn man or Finn folk um, would reside. Uh, that's where they would take their abductees to. Um, so, yeah, so uh, another part of the story, there, there's um, a wonderful chap called John Macaulay. And um, he wrote a book on this kind of folklore um, many years ago. And he put forward the idea that it was in the Finn folk, the, the root of them was possibly the sea sami um, sailing and coming to the, island, the islands and had been doing so for many, many years. Um, the reason for that would be the, their mode of transport, which was these, these boats with no sail. Um, that they could possibly be their, their canoes or kayaks, and they would actually be made of seal skin. And also the outfits that um, the Sisame would have worn at the time would have looked very, very different to the island folk. They didn't really make much use of seals in that fashion. Um, they, they really, you know, they didn't really use them for meat or their skins um, all that often either. Um, in Scotland in particular, um, seals, and this is kind of going into the Selkie kind of um, story angle of it, 
they can be seen as a bit of a pest to fishermen, so there's not a great love for them. Um, but that's getting onto that story, side of the story. So yeah, so the fin folk, um, the idea that it was sea sami, that there were people coming from you know Scandinavia, from Finland, from you know the upper part of Norway, coming all this way to the islands. And this was another way of describing these people that they didn't recognize or understand or anything like that. So, so yeah, so that's the Finn folk. That's fascinating. And, and I, I may be getting a small detail of this wrong, but, but the, 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 the Finn name would have br- been a very broad uh, term to refer to it. Essentially, they, they wouldn't have, have distinguished between the Sami or the, the Southern Finnic tribes or anything like that. And I think this, this goes all the way back to even uh, Tacitus. I think he was the first to refer to them in one of his books. It might have been in Germania. I, I, I'd have to, to double check some of those details. I might have gotten a little thing wrong here or there, but that's that's fascinating, and that makes a lot of sense. Honestly, that's that's such a such an interesting explanation. Well, in Shetland, um, they it's, it's funny between the two different islands. So in Orkney, the the Finn part of it, they explain the use of that word as part of the um, the kind of the, the makeup or the phys- physical attribute of the actual Finn man or woman as part of their outfit. Um, and they, they conceal that when they're walking um, around like, you know, t- like a person. Um, but when they're at sea, they use that as it, it helps them um, with, their, you know, cutting through this, the water. However, in Shetland, it's quite different. And now these islands are not that far apart when you look at it. Um, but they actually um, associate the, the word fin with actually the, the sea sami. So, there's a story um, in one of the books that I read and it goes back to um, a chap who um, is visiting a Norwegian friend and um, he's explaining his encounter with a Finn man or Finn woman and um, the Norwegian chap goes on to explain, you know, the what to fear from them and things like that. Um, and so it's it's quite interesting that it's taken from that kind of point of view from the angle that they're talking to somebody you know Norse Norwegian instead so it's just two different kind of understandings of the use of the word this definitely uh reminds me of the idea of like giants in Norse mythology and that they're not they they do have these kind of supernatural qualities but at the same time they were like it was just another tribe, right? And you could interbreed and like, this is, uh, but it was just other humans, but who did things differently and looked maybe a little different. And, uh, it, I, I think it's neat that you kind of see a similar trend, I guess, also like more Southern European areas, not that Scotland's like Southern Europe, but, uh, just this idea that you do attribute to like the others, these sort of fantastical qualities. Like, I, I think that's very interesting and probably says a lot about uh, humans. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, from reading lots of the different stories, um, it kept coming up again and again, this idea of sorcery or magic um, or shamanism, things like that, kept popping up again and again to explain this one particular aspect, which I thought was really interesting. Um and it's, it kind of it continues throughout the the stories as well. So it's obviously something that the people believes quite strongly in. Can you can you dig into that a little bit? How how sorcery and magic is connected to all this? Well, the um, because of the the way that um, the the fin folk were managed to kind of sail in the water, um, people didn't use that kind of technology at all. So for them, it was kind of like there was no sail involved. So, oh my goodness, how are you managing to do this? There was also a part of the tale that um, the Finn folk had the ability to travel um, great great distances very, very quickly. So there's a line in one of the stories that says from um, Shetland to Norway and Iceland. So it's quite interesting that those are the locations that are being used in the tale as well. That's a it's a huge span of of land, right? With only really the the pharaohs kind of in the the middle there. And actually, that got me thinking when you said that the the two islands or the island groups of the Orkneys and the Shetlands even having such different 
takes on these tales and their their own folklore. When we talked to Harry Jonsson from Tuyer, he's he's from the Faroe Islands and and he was telling us a lot about how the Faroes had their own traditions and things that was distinct from the mainland, distinct from Iceland, and and just having that isolation is is something really really fascinating there and so so having these tales across such a huge span of space that's that's quite something too that's absolutely one of the things that has really caught my attention um when it comes to like the silky folklore um it's incredible that in the Faroe Islands and in uh, Norway and in um also Shetland and Orkney Plus, the coastline of Scotland all share a common story um, about this one being, and it really doesn't differ, you know, from from place to place. And it's just incredible that that one story has travelled so far and lasted so long. It's it's just fascinating. Oh, that's fantastic! And the the point about how these Finn folk would have possibly traveled by magic or folklore that's that's definitely one of the more interesting ideas we've been digging into is how magic has the same function as technology and it, it's really the the shorthand for explaining ha- technology that, that you don't understand and it's it's it plays a, a huge role in, in these stories because if if the if the people in Orkneys and Shetland didn't understand the technology there well what's the explanation and that appears to be magic where we can uh, thank Jonathan Paggio for having a little bit more uh, giving a little bit of clarity to that idea but that was something that was coming up in the the episode we did recently about Volun so that that's a, a good parallel absolutely actually I really thoroughly enjoyed that episode that you did on Volun um it's just it's one of my favorite poems and um, I I completely get sucked into when I'm reading about it. It just kind of grows arms and legs um, because just through the, um, the different variations of stories um, for Wayland, the Smith, Voland and things like that. So it's wonderful. That's interesting because um, I don't think either Luke or I had seen or read uh, about Wayland or Voland before. And then uh, like we'd heard the name, but I didn't know the, the story at all. Yeah, I, I'd maybe read it once or something when I when reading through the entire poetic edo over the course of some weeks or something like that but it, i didn't dwell on it. it it didn't grab my attention like some others but it, it was it was a fun one to dig into except well and now it's like wow this is there's a lot going on here and um i know for me the the revenge that he gets like spoiler alert for people who oh. haven't <laughs> read it like that's hardcore stuff. That oh, I yeah. wasn't necessarily expecting that. <laughs> no, it takes a really sin- well. It takes a few sinister turns. The the story really does, and um, I think the the um, obviously when he's captured by Nithuth and um, kind of left immobile, that rage has um, time to grow, and you know he really can foster it, and um, he takes out his revenge in a really unbelievable way. I just I felt my okay, it gets worse. <laughs> so, um, well, it's, that's something you can relate to as well, right? If you, if you ever feel wronged or something like that, uh, it, that resentment and and rage can can grow up inside you, and the the consequences. I, I mean, the the story doesn't end with a happy ending for anyone really. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting lesson. There, there's a lot of complexity there. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even for Boland, um, he gets to, you know, he escapes from his imprisonment, but he's forever changed. And, um, there's a legacy kind of left there now as well. Um, and, and Nithu's daughter. So it's, um, it's, it's really, it's a complex tale um, about the way people can behave towards one another. Um, and uh, Diedrich of Bern, that story kind of, um, it's a little, it varies a little bit on the ending of um, the uh, Volan the Smith, but it goes on to talk a little bit more about the life of, what, you know, afterwards what goes on and what happens there. It's really entertaining. It's a really bizarre saga, right enough. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. It's got so many different characters in it. But um, I think definitely the the poem itself is is my favorite one. We might have to check into that. Yeah, you're bringing up a lot of uh, a lot of things, a lot of sources. We're gonna have to get all the the books you've mentioned and things like that to to put below, just uh, just to link to and and things. And because this is this is fantastic. I mean, we do our best to to 
read a, a lot and dig into the the things but for for our episodes that we're covering but you know it's 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 great you you have have read so widely and uh read so many things that i i think we've we've never touched on so that's again it's it's great to get to talk to you about some of that stuff oh, thank you and absolutely i would say the same um you guys mentioned so many wonderful sources in your podcasts and um i, I really enjoy kind of going back and, and looking over and and um, it's just it's so great because i think you can be really interested in researching in a subject um but another pair of eyes might look at it completely differently in a different direction so um yes yeah, it's, it's great definitely that's that's what we find like yeah the, that other pair of eyes is fantastic because then it's just like oh i didn't think of it like that at all and then there's another you know rabbit hole to go down if if there's one weakness about our setup the everything that we're doing dan and i it's it's that we are very interested in a lot of the same things and and if, if one of us is is reading a book and we recommend it to the other and that's like oh yeah let's 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 go read this and I, I think we do do pretty well about uh, approaching some things from a different perspective but then getting to talk to you for example yeah you, you just bringing in something from outside our our little sphere that we've got going is is helpful to say the least oh thank you very much <laughs> so something that we we touched on a little bit before, um, as we were talking about Voland and these other uh, sort of mystical creatures. It just got, it got me thinking. Like if you look at myths and fairy tales today, they're very kind of safe and watered down. You know, there's not there's not a lot of uh, real dread there anymore. And I was thinking, like, what's your take on why do you think we've kind of sanitized these stories or gone away from like because there were real lessons there like with uh with the various horrors that people face but also you know they were fairy tales so they were it was teaching children that in the face of these horrors you you can actually face them and survive and now it's just i don't know like you read some of the fairy tales from back in the day and it's like what is going on here oh, like sure. you told this to children <laughs> it's so true some of the folklore i read um and i just the story starts off okay it's not too bad um it's a typical setup and by the end of it you think to yourself what on earth have i read that is so dark <laughs> i wasn't expecting that at all um i think that today um just with the technology coming on the way that it has children um, in particular have got more access to information that, you know, even we didn't have when we were younger or parents or anything like that. Um, and I think that as well, um, some fairy tales seems to be more for entertainment value rather than a warning being kind of translated or, um, even passing on of information anymore. It's just that we seem to be losing that part of it for just the fun factor, possibly, and um, for something that appeals very quickly and and that'll do sort of thing. And um, I think it's a shame. Um, that was one of the reasons I, I wanted to do the podcast was to share the kind of, or not original stories, but the, the stories the way that they were intended. Um I am, I've always been much more fascinated in stories that are a little bit darker, that there, you have a little bit more to think about. Um, and it, particularly um, in Scottish mythology, there are a lot of mentions um, on use of the word fairy, which can be a bit misleading um, as well, because it's not always this lovely winged creature or anything like that. Um, when we talk about fairies, we have a lot of kind of, it covers um, an area such like trolls or um, like, you know, little demons, things like that. A fairy wasn't always a kind creature. It was malevolent. But today, when, you know, children are looking at things, they probably see the kind creature. They're not really, they don't know where kind of the other side of the story, you know, where that came from. Um, so I would really like to see possibly, um, I don't know how popular it would be, but it would be nice to see fairy tales and things come, becoming a little bit, seeing a bit of a change. That would be good. I would really like that. I do wonder, like, how how it would affect a child. Like, if you if you were to t tell the same bedtime stories, but just with the the more like original content, like you know Cinderella, but now like the stepsisters are sawing off toes to fit into that <laughs> glass slipper to be a yeah. you know because they want to be a princess. But I I wonder if that would serve them, or if it would, or if times have changed so much, it would just like 
com- almost ostracize them from they'd be like i can't relate to society now i don't know just mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no definitely i've been um i've been doing a lot of research into children in the viking age um recently and um one of the things that i was really interested in was um how the poems and the myths and the sagas would have affected a child growing up um what their lives would have been like and how they might have thought about those stories and you know what what actually was childhood for you know you know kids back then and um just looking purely on the information side of it um so you you were considered a child um by the time well for for young boys about 15 or 16 years of age a young girls could be married by the age of 12 um and once that happens they were considered an adult so childhood was extremely short um also, when um, you were growing up in the, the society or, you know, the farm and things like that, there wasn't really a separation of jobs. So um, as soon as you were old enough to help, you did. And you, you, you learned what your parents, you know, were doing and it carried on that way. So childhood was very, very different back then. And I think um, it's probably maybe the last few decades where things have really changed completely um, and stories have changed. and society has changed I think um, there's a lot of um, protection for children nowadays you know don't want them exposed to anything that's kind of too dark or or strange Um, but you know um, certainly children in the Viking era I think probably the stories and tales would have made a lot of sense to them Um, and even the darker ones the you know life was very very different and they, they would have faced a lot kind of harsher things than possibly we um, have ever had to deal with. So, yeah do you, do you think we're losing something by not exposing children to these darker stories? And and maybe the maybe the other side of it too, just to to flesh this out a little. You mentioned that their lives would have been a lot harsher, so the stories would have made more sense. So maybe this is a two parter. Do you think we've lost anything by by losing the the darkness in these stories? Or I don't want this to be an either or, but um, maybe be, maybe our children wouldn't be able to relate to that because that harshness isn't there in life. What, what do you think of that whole big yeah. mess of a question? So, <laughs> I think, well, I, I, I do think that children are capable of understanding a lot more than possibly we kind of give them credit for. Um, and it could, it, a lot today um, is probably the fact that we as adults are understanding things um, and wanting to protect children from things in our society that isn't very nice, but um, that doesn't always benefit them. I think that um, certainly when I was growing up, um, I was really encouraged to read everything that I wanted to. Um, There wasn't, um, I was never ever told you can't read that because it's not suitable for you. Um, You know, I guess my my parents and my grandparents thought if you can understand it, um, that's good. If you have a question about it, ask me, you know, but but don't, I'm never going to say you can't read that or don't go there or anything. And um, I I think sometimes possibly that might be missing a little bit as well um, nowadays. And I think it probably... I think as long as the material isn't too graphically um, kind of offensive in any way, that it's, I think it probably would be beneficial for children to know like the the flip side, the darker side of stories, to um, because they have questions for sure. And I'm just thinking about kind of my my own family and explaining kind of stories as I do to them, and I don't tend to leave anything out. But then. Um, they're never really that horrifying. <laughs> so um, I think I think definitely um, it, it, children definitely have an, an idea. They can grasp. They've got pretty good imaginations, so they can they can go there. Yeah, you mentioned, I suppose, graphic violence and things like that, and 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 I suppose the other the other thing that would be a good idea to avoid with children is is material that's sexually explicit. But the and 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 that's that's pretty clear why but the the whole thing some of these stories are pretty graphically violent themselves they don't have to necessarily describe in in words i'm trying to think of a, of a good example i'm, I'm sure you, you know though like i mean like to stories of, of children getting eaten or something oh, yeah, like that absolutely yeah some of the classic fairy tales um like when you, you kind of look at the story um 
so we always want the monster to kind of be killed. But, you know, and children grow up thinking, well, okay, kill that monster. That's great. That's wonderful. But when you think about it, the story of actually causing harm, of going out there, of, you know, of killing anything, that's a pretty big concept to deal with. But a kid just accepts it as part of the story and that's the bad guy and that's what you do, um, you know, with, with these stories. Um, and I don't think possibly that they think about it in, in too much um, of a more complex way than that for, you know, children can pretty much just say, okay, that's it. They put that aside and they move on to something else. Yeah, so maybe it's a, it, it doesn't need to have a, a graphic nature for it to still get across a point that's that's useful and symbolic and that would be useful to to bring back into into stories that at least kids are allowed to maybe uh, explore if they want to not i wouldn't force anything down anyone's throat but uh, not a bad idea to have the option absolutely yeah i think so um i can remember when i was a, a kid and uh, the animated version of the lord of the rings came out and um i remember watching that and i was like it, it's not the cheeriest of <laughs> stories in certain parts, but um, I, I'm not even sure that, you know, um, we would see something like that happen again, kind of nowadays. Um, it was, it's very, very different, I think. Well, th- this is going to date me in reverse in that I, w- I was just, uh, I was I... Uh, between seven and nine when the Lord of the Rings movies came out and I got to watch them and everything. And I read the books and everything right when that happened. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm little, don't, no. yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> but, but no, it was, it was fantastic. And, and it, it piqued my imagination and, and it was, it was good. And then those stories are, are not, um, they're, they're not easy and they're, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, they're they're worth exploring, and they're definitely something I was able to handle at that that age. And it, it Lord of the Rings is one of the best archetypal heroic stories. It's not it's not coming direct from mythology, but it's steeped in it, and and things like that. Uh, and then and then maybe contrast that with say Harry Potter, which came out a few years later. There's still some fantastic symbolism there, and some some violent moments, and it's. Th- that's not sanitized either. It's it's different. It's a different setting. It's more modern, and and I think it gets the the modern the modern idea that life isn't quite so harsh as uh, as say the 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 typical medieval setting of the the Lord of the Rings. But but that is the was or has been the the major book for for kids in a while. I, I don't even know what what kids are reading these days i'm i'm sure some of them still still read harry potter and the lord of the oh, rings yeah. and i sure hope so because that was so. a huge part of my childhood oh harry potter is absolutely fantastic i'm not gonna lie <laughs> um my my young cousins um there's a bit of an age gap between us so um i got to um have that lovely moment when they were very young and we would read these stories together and stuff or the lord of the rings they were completely indoctrinated with the movies from a very young age so um They've, they've kind of it's really nice though that they've grown up with that kind of in the same way that I did with um, kind of books and things and um, and also I think um, they, they, when I was growing up um, there were a lot of kind of fantasy movies um, the 80s were particularly good for that kind of medieval fantasy kind of thing that was going on um, which I was completely absolutely in love with so yeah I guess it all ties up together and um the mythology especially um and Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings that whole thing for me was just fantastic I loved every part of it is that linked to these mythologies and that symbolism why you think this is is what captures the imaginations of so many people these these fantasy books movies all that yeah I think so I think um when you look at these stories um at the center of it there's always um an underlying kind of story a reason for you know the everything that's happening and um, it's always looking back to an older time or a more mystical time and having some thread in there um, that you can say, oh, actually, OK, that's that comes from here. That's from that mythology or that comes from that part of history. And um, and that was that was one of the ways that um, when I was younger um, and uh, as a child that I kind of got into Vikings and things because my granddad would say, oh, that's part of this uh, kind of mythology or, you know, this, that's Volsung Saga, things like that. And you're kind of like, hey, what is that? And you go away and you read about it and, and it just it kind of just gets bigger and bigger from there. Definitely. When you're talking about uh, the Lord of the Rings, it 
it actually uh, brought me back to uh, the animated version of The Hobbit, which scarred me. Gollum and that was <laughs> just absolutely terrifying. And uh, it also it also made me think of um, I don't I don't know if you've seen it. I, I'm assuming I'm just going to assume you have a, a Watership Down. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. I lost so many nights of sleep from that as a child. Oh, exactly. Like it, I know, like with my wife and I, like we've talked about, like what age would we show our future children Watership Down? Because you want you want to get get it in that age where they almost can't handle it. It's like just above their ability to handle it, so that they have to get over it because it's scar. It's I mean, scarred generations of children. I I I read it first and, and saw it like when I was like thirteen, and I was still like, oh my god, this is shocking, <laughs> intense. Like, yeah, it was. I think um, I wasn't pre- at all prepared for that story. Um, you know, I hadn't read it. Um, I went into the movie thinking, oh, this is going to be lovely, and <laughs> it very quickly was not uh, what, what I kind of thought it was going to be. And um, but I think that's the mark of an incredibly good story that is, has stayed with you all that time. Um, and lots of people can relate to that particular story in the same way. They came away with the same feelings. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it will call it kind of other people who haven't maybe seen it and listening to this will go away and have a look at that and see what we're talking about. For sure. And for listeners, there's a new version of it on Netflix. Um, that's not like, it's okay. That's not the one you want to, the one you want to see is like the animated one from the late seventies, I think. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like that one is, that one will just grab you by the soul and like, make you make you face life like there's no i don't know it's fantastic highly recommend it um but it it, i was thinking like that's kind of the last like story that has that like last modern story that has that like real horrifying like this is life laid out like and children look at it because you're you have to face this too and after that it got a lot a lot more disney Yes. Yeah. I, I, everything became a lot more kind of sanitized and um, a kind of, I guess, a, a prettier, nicer version of these stories. But um, I think that movies like Worship Down or that one definitely in particular, um, I would still, even though it's it's a heck of a story to take, I would really encourage people to to watch it. And um, I mean, I, I watched it with my parents, so I, I don't see any reason why not um, that kids can go and do the same um, it might take, oh, their, sure. might take their parents back to a time that they'd rather forget right enough. But <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and and the whole thing about kids being able to handle all this stuff, right? I I think there is something too that these these stories and understanding them. That's it's the blueprint for how kids can face life in general. So you you take it from the the theoretical side of it, which is exploring these stories, and you can almost do it from the physical safety of wherever you are, whether movie theater or at your couch or TV, something like that, or, or reading a book, wherever you can, you can explore this stuff in physical safety, but then on a, on a, on an emotional level, on a, on an intellectual level, you're, you're almost just right in there and, and you get to sort of deal with the feelings of, of what it would be like to be in these, these situations and these stories. And, and yeah, I, I think there, there is actually one, there's some evidence of this that there's a disconnect between between kids these days actually uh, absorbing the the lessons from not just these stories that that's not where the the body of research currently is, I don't think, but it's it's that kids aren't prepared to deal with the the harsh realities of of everyday life. and that's that's why we're seeing a lot of issues with anxiety and and depression and things like that and really affecting especially in the US campus culture but i believe it is it is starting to kind of seep into uh, the UK as well and and this is this is just because the generation of of kids that are in colleges and things like that are well have a, a, a large enough percentage of them have have not been adequately prepared to handle the the reality of life and anxiety and depression is is almost a natural response and I, I think there is something too that if there was more more um option to explore 
stories like these. I don't know if it's been de-emphasized over the the course of the last little while. I'm I'm grateful and lucky that it wasn't for me. And I and I am technically near the end of the millennial generation, but it's the one after me, the Generation Z, I Gen, that's most affected by this. So I'm theoretically I I missed the the cut there. So the the cutoff lines a couple years after me, but. I think it was. I was listening to your your one of your podcasts, and you guys were talking about talk about technology and children um, or young people exposed to kind of social media and the pressures of it and things like that. And I found that so interesting, and it's really, really very true. Um, I can remember well, certainly um, when I was at school, there were no mo- no mo- mobile phones or. PCs, computers and things, didn't we didn't operate the same way, email and internet and everything. I remember when it wasn't really a thing. <laughs> and so um, things have just changed so, so much. And the whole advent of um, like social media, um, being able to have group chats of kids that um, is in no way, shape or form monitored or anything. And, you know, it's, it's like a whole new form of um, interaction that um, happens just, you know, not face-to-face or anything like that. I think um, it gives a lot of freedom for people to possibly say and behave in a way that they ordinarily wouldn't do. Um, can really understand in, um, in the UK um, mental health issues and becoming aware of that in young people has become a really big thing. Um, they are really aware of the pressures that kids are facing when they go to university and things um and it's and it's purely simply because it's just you know it's not how things certainly were when I was studying or anything like that we, we didn't have the same issues I'm sure that there were you know people that were suffering from anxiety and depression and stuff but not to the degree that it's kind of happening now well yeah and and, and the where people were looking originally was that campus culture had somehow changed and and maybe there was difference there in in what kids were were facing but if you look before that into into childhood and things like that it it seems like that's where this really started that the change in campus culture is the symptom not the cause and and the the challenges for kids being able to deal with life with smartphones and things like that growing up with smartphones it's 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 significant and i don't know i, I don't want to sound like a th- this the equivalent of a modern day Luddite sort of thing, but but maybe it, it would be better to to encourage kids to get off social media and read a book instead of uh, instead of engaging with these devices and things like that. And I, I me a few years ago, I, I don't think I would ever have have thought I would say something like that, but it, it does seem to be the case. So yeah, no, I, I agree, I really do. Um, I think. Um, just from from writing and things like that and reading, I would always always prefer to to say to somebody, go and go and read a book or go find out. You know, you don't need to go online. Just open up a book and and find out for yourself. Definitely. Shifting gears a little bit, um, one of the uh, symbols that we've talked about offline that I've been sort of I've been chewing on a lot are uh, ravens. And I was I was looking into this uh, sort of for the, for this interview. Uh, I was looking at um, I guess the Morrigan and and Odin because they both are very much associated with ravens. And I, I sort of wanted to get your take because I'm I'm definitely more of a I know a lot more about Odin than I do about the Morrigan. I was wondering if you know about the Morrigan and if you could maybe give a sort of a recap of who they are and sort of we can go into that and sort of figure out what's going on with these uh, two big deities. Yeah, but certainly um, it's an area that I will need to go into a little bit more. Um, but with the raven, um, the the birds itself um, or the, the symbol of the raven, it was associated with um, foresight and um to, to see one, it could be um, as a portent of impending doom or misfortune or something like that. Um, whereas with Odin, um, it was sending um, the ravens out to gather wisdom and you know to see the what was happening in Midgard. Um, I think in Celtic mythology as well, the raven was also associated with battle. Um, so that that's probably 
the most that I know in that particular sense about that. Um, it's definitely something I need to go into in much more detail um, when I'm doing my research. Yeah, because well, ravens and, and battle, it makes sense because they they would eat the dead. You know, it was a, it was a good time for them because I mean they didn't have to do any work. It was just hey, fresh meat. Yep. <laughs> but uh, I and I I do think it's interesting because you, you've got um, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but uh, Badab. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, is that just bad? Is fine. Bad? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, as one of the one aspect or one part of the the Morrigan, but like the the battle. I guess goddess of battle, goddess of war, uh, having ravens associated with her, so, and that makes sense. I mean, as just said, ravens eat the the dead, and then we ha- we also have it with um, with Odin, and it's not it's actually not so much associated with battle with him because it's more thought and memory, right? Yes. But as you were as you were just saying, um, there's also this idea of, of foresight with and. It, and I was thinking that that's interesting because you've got thought and memory. Those two things are what sort of give you the ability f- to have foresight because you can look back on things that were, oh, this situation is similar to this. Okay, well, how how do I think this is going to play out? Well, okay, I'm going to assume that this is sort of the uh, the spectrum of possibilities on how it plays out. I, I find that fascinating. Oh, absolutely. I think um, in, in folklore as well, certainly in Scotland, and I, I'm fairly certain when I say that in England, this might be the case as well. Um, folklore stories um, about the appearance of a raven, it was always um, as if it was uh, like a portent of doom. It was always an omen. Um, and to, to see one definitely was not um, it was not favourable. Um so that was a story that I certainly grew up with, um, you know, and being in a kind of rural location and stuff like that. I always remember um, my mother and my grandfather, things like that, saying, oh, if you see a raven, it's not a good sign at all. And you should always look the other way. So it's something that's obviously carried down in the folklore as well. I wonder why that is the, to, to say, uh, look the other way, because I, I think on some level that even the the symbolic character of, of Odin as well, it's he he's not very nice but the lessons that he represents the at least what i've the way i've dug into it is that what odin wants you to do tells you to do is the hardest things that you can conceive of but it's going to produce the the greatest benefit and so seeing that raven maybe it's maybe that's saying like there's there's something bad or hard yeah. That that may be that may be really tough to to deal with, but uh, it, maybe it's what's necessary, something like that. So I, I wonder why that would have gone specifically though to all the way to look away from the raven. I think um, in the kind of um, folklore kind of sense, it might have been if you were to um, to look at the raven or to look into the eyes of the bird, it would be accepting the whatever reason that it was there was going to come to you. So um, if you didn't, if you avoided that, then possibly you're kind of sidestepping whatever is is kind of intended. That's interesting. I know in uh, in North America, and I think this is elsewhere as, as well, but uh, particularly like. I don't know, uh, Midwestern U.S. and more Southern, uh, there's a, a tradition of, um, if you see a magpie, and I don't know if you've got uh, magpies yes. in Scotland, uh-huh. yeah. but you're supposed to greet it before it can greet you because the mag- magpie is like an emissary of the devil. And if you can show that you're polite first, it's going to sort of let you go on your way without without trouble. But if if it gets to you first and it's like, oh no, like, it it got me. Yeah. Oh gosh, I've never heard that before. That's that's really fascinating, actually. Um, I don't know. Um, certainly with, with magpies, there's the kind of traditional kind of you know thoughts about them um, as bothersome birds over here. But um, I'm not sure about um, any folklore, so I definitely want to look into that one. Yeah, there's there's um, this, this is a, a little bit of a rabbit hole. But there's actually a band uh, called Murder by Death, and they're like a, they're. It sounds like like black metal, but they're not. It's more uh, basically folk music with kind of like a Johnny Cash tinge to it, maybe Bruce Springsteen Uh thrown in there. Uh Um, 
and they've got a they've got an album called Good Morning Magpie, and it's they kind of get into it there, and uh, you know it it is fascinating, and yeah, it's that's one of the things about folklore is that there's so much of it steeped into everything that we do. That this, I'm sure there's a ton of things that we do regularly that we don't even know that well it actually comes from folklore or turns a phrase that absolutely well it, here's where it comes from you know yeah that uh, when i was um, kind of looking into older stories there were a few kind of um ones where it was kind of explaining where that phrase came from and i wish i had written some of them down to share with you today but, uh, i'll have to email them <laughs> no that'd be great uh, all the all the sources that, that you dig up and, and have sent over and you know, offline and everything like that. That's always, always fascinating. And we'll, we'll have to get some of them to, to just list, uh, again, I think I mentioned before, but we'll, we'll, we'll list some of this stuff, uh, below just because it's, it's so interesting. Right. Absolutely. And so I think, uh, I think we'll start uh, wrapping up a little bit. Um, what, uh, what's sort of coming down the pipe for, uh, Siobhan in the future? Sure. So, um, I think I've, I've not got an exact date for publication yet, but my next book's going to be out um, in June. So I'm really looking forward to it coming out. Um, I decided to do something a little bit different with this book. And um, originally it was a collection of short stories that were all kind of um, stemming from Norse mythology um, with a few little kind of um, stories and they're going to sneak in from Celtic mythology and uh, Scottish folklore as well. Um, so that that was the initial idea, which was great. And then I kind of decided about halfway through to change the way that the stories were going to come across. And I have decided to have them being told by three characters. So the characters will be um, the old man, uh, the warrior and the mother. And so they'll each tell a set of short stories that will kind of... Um, give the reader an idea of, of life um, in the Viking era and some of the tales and the sagas and things like that. So I'm actually really excited about it. It's quite different from anything that I've done before. So um, so yeah, once I get a date, then that will be out. And um, it's going to be called Tales from the Northlands. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And continuing um, with the podcast, got a lot of ideas for where I want to take um, the next set of episodes and um, for the f next few episodes we're going to be um, or I'm going to be focusing still on kind of nature and water and um, things like that so those are the two main things I've got coming up and um, it's keeping me busy so <laughs> it's, it's a lot to look forward to. Oh I bet that uh, you, you sound very busy I mean the, all those things take up a lot of time so uh, where can people find information about you online and you know if they want to order your book and listen to your podcast like where can we uh, find you sure so um i'm always on twitter um and i've got my own account which is at um, siobhan coda and the one for the myth legend and lore podcast is at lore myth and um if anybody has um any stories or anything like that i just i love to share all these kind of um, stories and sources and things. Um, I have an email address, which is mlegendslore at gmail.com. And um, the, my first book is um, available on Amazon and main bookstores. You'll find that one there. Um, and the next one, it will be appearing there too. Um, and I'll include all of that in an announcement um, once I've got some dates and things to, to give to people. Wonderful. That's, that's very exciting. This, this, book of yours sounds yeah it's it's a bit it's not in the same uh, vein obviously as your your first which is is uh that that was fiction historical fiction but but this this sounds this is very different and sounds quite exciting we'll we'll be looking forward to this one for sure oh, absolutely thank you. <laughs> do you have plans to continue that uh that series the children of midgard or anything like that yeah um, I've been kind of continuously working on stories and kind of um, splintering off um, the characters into their own kind of um, stories and adventures and working on ideas. Um, and I guess that's where um, kind of Norse history and mythology is um, such a great um, area to work from because so much happens. There are so many different areas that you can take the characters to. And um, 
I think my my slight obsession that's beginning to grow with Finland and the Kalevala and things like that. Um, there's so much that you can kind of do. So, um, yeah, I'm always working on something else in the background. But I think um, the children of Midgard, I want to get it right where they're going after that story. It was it was a lot of fun to write that one. And it was one of my um, my favourite myths, um, certainly, that I covered. So, yeah, um, definitely the, the characters will be back. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, looking looking forward to seeing everything you've got coming up with the podcast, this this upcoming book. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks very much for for joining us. This is has been lovely to talk to you again, and uh, we we touched on a lot of interesting and fun topics this time. I think. Yeah, no, it's been absolutely fantastic. It's so nice to um, to be able to talk to you guys about it, um, and because we're we're kind of looking at everything from slightly slightly kind of different angles, so um, it makes for a really interesting conversation. So it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for for coming on, and uh, I I think with that we'll just wrap up with our usual housekeeping and everything like that. For sure. Um, for anyone who wants to. Uh, Get in touch with us. We're on all sorts of social media, uh, Facebook, uh, Northern Myths Podcast, uh, Twitter, at Northern Myth. And then there's, uh, we're both on Twitter as well, at North Myth Dan, at North Myth Luke, and then uh, Northern Myths Podcast on Instagram. Uh, absolutely get in touch with us on all of these platforms. We love uh, chatting with people. And as Siobhan just said, having uh, a different set of eyes on everything from a different like a slightly different angle or a vastly different angle is awesome because that's how we, uh, how we think and get more ideas about these amazing stories. Uh, as well, we've got, uh, a merchandise store where you can uh, get t-shirts and mugs, uh, that'll have the, uh, the Northern Myths podcast logo, as well as some of our, uh, more well-known phrases. And, uh, we also have a list of, uh, recommended books and music, and you can uh, you can actually order those things from links on our uh, web page, and it's part of the Amazon affiliate program, so we'll get a little bit of money back for that. And uh, I know Siobhan, when we uh, when you publish your book, we will definitely put that on our uh, on our list. Thank you so much. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, I think I've covered everything, but uh, Luke, is there something I'm missing? Well, first, just one final thank you to Siobhan for, for coming on. Again, it, it's been great to talk to you. And uh, yeah, the, the last thing, as always with us, is uh, for everyone to go forth and find out what myth you're living. This is the Northern Myths Podcast. Thanks for listening.